All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I do not have any announcements at the top, so we can go straight to your questions. Darlene, would you like to start? Thanks. Um, so a federal judge has struck down um, administration regulations on hydraulic fracking and says the Interior Department doesn't have the authority to regulate fracking. Is there any reaction to that from the White House? And do you know at this point if you will, the administration will appeal that decision? Well, my understanding is that this is something that uh, uh, will be considered by the Tenth Circuit. Um, so I'd, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice for the uh, uh, legal procedures uh, at play here. Uh, we obviously believe that uh, we've got a, a strong argument to make about the important role the federal government can play in ensuring that hydraulic fracturing that's done on public lands doesn't th threaten the drinking water of people who live in the area. It's a pretty simple proposition, and the, it's indicative of the kind of common sense approach that the Obama administration has pursued. This is, approach, this is an approach that seeks to protect public health and public safety, while also creating space for innovators to strengthen the economy. And based on the results that we've seen in our economy from the dramatic increase in oil and gas that's produced in the United States, much of which is attributable to developments like fracturing, I think is an indication that <coughs> we've pursued this in the right way. Uh, that certainly has been our policy approach, but when it comes to the legal authority at stake, uh, we're, we'll continue to make our case in the courts. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio, <coughs> is there any surprise here that he has done an about face and is now deciding to run again for re-election? Well, I think everybody's surprised that uh, about his announcement, um, but uh, I'll leave it to him to uh, explain. Mark was apparently wasn't surprised. Mark was unpersuaded by the ten thousand times he said publicly <laughs> that uh, that he was not going to be a or that he was going to be a private citizen reported. in January. So. <laughs> That's, uh, the rest of us, I think, took Senator Rubio at his word, but Mark, ever the skeptic, <laughs> sniffed this one out. How much does this decision complicate efforts by Democrats to take that seat in November? Because you're now going from what would have been an open seat to an incumbent uh, well, defending. Yeah, the President has had, a, uh, has had the opportunity to express his vocal support for, the, for Congressman Murphy. Uh, the President's uh, uh, endorsement uh, outlines why the President believes that uh, Congressman Murphy would be an excellent United States Senator and why he would do an excellent job representing Florida in the United States Senate. Um, and uh, you know, there will be an opportunity for uh, uh, you know, an aggressive campaign, an aggressive debate. I know that uh, Florida has their party primaries rather late in the season, so that's something that both Congressman Murphy and Senator Rubio will have to contend with. Uh, both of them will have uh, tough primaries, and then uh, there will be a general election. Uh, but uh, you know, the President has uh, made, I think, a persuasive case about uh, the credentials and experience and values that Congressman Murphy brings to the job. Thanks. Okay. Aisha. Uh, um, so North Korea successfully uh, conducted a missile <coughs> test uh, today, and it seems like their technology is getting better. They don't seem to be slowing down in their pursuit of these weapons um, despite sanctions. I, I know that you've said before that their actions are going to leave them isolated, and but it doesn't seem that isolation and sanctions are, are leading to any change in what they're, they're doing or in their behavior. I mean, is there anything that the U.S. can do right now to, to influence North Korea? Like, what, I guess, what, what can, is there more that China needs to do? What can be done since it seems like what's going on right now hasn't really affected, them or affected their leaders? Well, let me start by saying that the United States strongly condemns the provocative actions by the North Korean government that is a flagrant violation of their international obligations. Um, uh, U.S. Strategic Command did, in fact, detect and track what we assess were two North Korean missile launches yesterday. Uh, the missiles were tracked over the Sea of Japan, where in initial indications are that they fell. Um, 
NORAD was also monitoring the launches and uh, determined that they did not pose a threat uh, to North America. Uh, but I do think that the impact of these provocations will be to only strengthen the resolve of the international community that has such serious concerns with North Korea's behavior. So um, the United States will do what we have done in the past, which is work with the international community, particularly our allies in South Korea and Japan. We'll also continue our ongoing dialogue with the Chinese and the Russians about what additional pressure can be applied uh, to the North Koreans. And you know, the key here will be to continue to um, uh, work with our allies and partners to uh, address this destabilizing threat in Northeast Asia. On another uh, topic, uh, President Putin said today that Russia must boost its combat readiness in response to NATO's aggressive actions. Um, and this comes after the German foreign minister had warned NATO against warmongering. Um, what is your response to this, to this latest comments from Putin and, and concerns that some NATO actions may actually be heightening tensions? Well, listen, we've been clear uh, as as often as possible about the fact that NATO is a defensive alliance, uh, that, uh, but that alliance is critical to the national security of the United States. It's the cornerstone of our national security policy, and these are uh, allies and partners who cooperate with us, not just to enhance the national security of the United States and Europe, but to actually respond to uh, other situations around the globe, including the situation in uh, uh, Afghanistan. We've talked in here before about how we value the contributions that our NATO partners have made to that effort. So, um, you, know, we'll, uh, you know, I'm confident that the President will um, have an opportunity to meet with our allies at the NATO summit in Warsaw next month, and there will be extensive discussions about what additional steps we can take to further strengthen uh, that alliance that's so critical to the national security of the United States. Okay. Michelle. Thanks, Josh. Um, are, are you aware of Donald Trump's speech on Clinton today? Did you see uh, it? I saw just a little bit of the coverage. I, I don't know that I'll have a whole lot to say about it, but. Well, saying things like Hillary Clinton has the blood of many on her hands, um, and, and he was repeating a quote that she should be in prison. Um, he also said a number of things that seemed on their face to not be true, and of course the whole thing will be fact-checked to death mm -hmm. soon. I hope so. Um, what do you think of that kind of rhetoric? Because a lot of these statements, I mean, even if some are proven to be false on their face, that message still got out today. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I think um, you know, the, the questions about how to most effectively cover and fact check and hold public officials accountable for their statements is something that uh, all of you and the executives at your media organizations have to uh, carefully consider. Uh, and uh, those are decisions that, uh, that all of you should make based on your own professional experience and expertise. Um, I think it's the responsibility of those who are in uh, the spotlight, and the President has certainly uh, embraced this uh, responsibility, which is to engage in debates that are rooted in fact and evidence and rationality. And um, our democracy is best served when public officials and those who are seeking power in our democracy willingly engage in that kind of fact-based debate. Um, so, and those who don't uh, should be held accountable for that, but uh, that accountability is provided by um, professional independent news organizations and ultimately by the, uh, the American people. I think it surprised a lot of people to hear him say those words. So, I mean, even in some sense, it, it was a shade of something he had said before, but to say that she has blood on her hands of many um, and that she should be in prison, uh, does that strike you as, you know, more off the mark than other things have been? Well, uh, when it comes to directly responding to uh, those kinds of charges, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues at the, the Clinton campaign and surely many others who I think would have uh, their own view to, uh, to register about the comments like that. And can you respond to the Democratic sit-in that's going on right now in Hill over guns, and also your reaction to the fact that Senator Collins' amendment doesn't really seem to be going anywhere? Yeah. Well, uh, as a, let me take the last one first, which is that uh, the Department of Justice uh, and 
officials at the FBI continue to uh, review the proposal that's been put forward, or at least it's been floated by Senator Collins. Um, and you know, the position of the administration remains the same, which is that we believe that everyone who is suspected of having ties to terrorism should be prevented from buying a gun. Um, unfortunately, Republicans blocked legislation that would do that. That's unfortunate. Uh, but look, if there's a step that would prevent some people who are suspected of having ties to terrorism from being able to buy a gun, then we'd support that too. I don't really understand why we wouldn't go for, why we would prioritize the watered down version over the extra strength version. But um, that's apparently the way the legislative process works. What we're working to determine right now is whether uh, or not the, the current proposal can be shaped to effectively accomplish the goal that uh, it states to set out, or that it sets out to achieve. Um, and that's something that's under review at the Department of Justice and the FBI, and we'll continue to remain in touch with members of Congress uh, as, they ca as they continue to consider it. As it relates to, uh, to House Democrats, um, I, I think they're showing the kind of uh, frustration and even anger that people around the country have about the inability of the Republican-led Congress to take common sense steps that would protect the American people. And I think they're resorting to what I think even they would acknowledge is an extraordinary step to change the status quo in the House of Representatives that prevents even consideration of common sense gun safety legislation. The thing to keep in mind is what Democrats are asking for is neither radical nor controversial. They're asking for votes and bipartisan support for policies that are supported by a majority of Democrats, a majority of Republicans, and a majority of gun owners all across the country. These are common sense proposals that do not undermine the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Americans, but they are common sense proposals that would in fact succeed in at least making it harder for individuals who shouldn't have guns from being able to get their hands on them. It's a common sense proposition. It's not controversial. And uh, uh, Democrats, I think, are rightly frustrated that those kinds of proposals haven't even been called up for a vote by the Republicans who are in charge of the Congress. And uh, they are taking some extraordinary steps to try to change that. Has the President spoken to Senator Collins or any of the others that were trying to hammer out uh, a compromise? Uh, I don't know that the President has uh, been involved in any of those conversations in the last 24 well, hours. But be, Well, because this is something that, that, that frankly, is, uh, uh, is being negotiated in, uh, in the Senate. There's no ambiguity about the administration position on this. There are some important technical questions that do have to be considered, and that's exactly what officials at the, at the Department of Justice and the FBI are reviewing. And, um, you know, frankly, those are, are questions related to the technical way in which uh, these new rules and procedures and laws would be implemented. So, uh, you know, if we determine that it's necessary or would be helpful for the president to intervene, I'm sure he would not hesitate to do so. But to this point, that has not been necessary. Thanks. Okay. Mark. Yeah, Josh, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll okay. ask it anyhow. Okay. What do you think of Paul Ryan's uh, health care plan? Well, I think, um, uh, I think a couple of things. How long do you have? Um, well, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I, I think what I would simply say is that for six years now, Republicans have vowed to put an Obamacare alternative on the floor of the Congress. And for six years now, they've broken that promise. The proposal that they put forward today does include some more details. But the details that they've put forward are wildly unpopular, which is why I suspect they will not be put to a vote in the Republican-led Congress. These are proposals like privatizing Medicare, uh, and specific proposals that even those Republicans acknowledge would raise costs for working families and for uh, older Americans. There are a whole host of other details that are not included in there. I suspect the reason that those details are not included is that they're even worse than the details that are provided. Uh, and these are details that relate to how much the program would cost. 
because the Republican proposal is to uh, repeal a bunch of the Obamacare measures that actually do have the effect of reducing the deficit, uh, but yet Republicans believe that those should be um, taken away. They also don't want to get into much detail about how many millions of Americans would lose health care coverage as a result uh, of their proposal. So uh, again, because they're making decisions based on politics, not based on actually trying to get something done, it's not si surprising to me that the most unpopular, controversial, unworkable elements of their plan uh, are not detailed in their proposal that's rolled out today. Does Speaker Ryan get at least some credit for getting consensus on something in his talk? Well, what consensus does he have? If he actually has consensus, then why wouldn't they put it to a vote? Again, Speaker Ryan is not the chair of some think tank here in Washington, D.C. He is the Speaker of the House of Representatives who presides over the agenda of the House of Representatives and wields the, the authority of a historically large Republican majority in the House of Representatives. So, no, he doesn't get any credit for writing a white paper that doesn't include many details. If he were actually serious about his job and actually serious about trying to improve the health care system in this country, then he'd put forward a, a legislative proposal that would pass the House of Representatives. But he hasn't done other one. Okay. All right, well, there you go. I'm glad we could uh, uh, have this uh, entertaining exchange anyway. Um, Ron. Um, any word on the um, rescheduling of the uh, President's and um, Secretary's Wisconsin campaign trip? Uh, not at this point, um, uh, but as soon as we have more details, we'll let, we'll let you know. It's just a matter of trying to make their two schedules work. Do you think it would happen next week sometime? Um, Sooner rather than later, or is there? Well, is there we're obviously time? interested in trying to, to get this on the books as soon as we can. I don't yet know at this point whether or not we'll be able to get it done next week, but um, once we figure that out, we'll definitely let you know. Um, the meeting this afternoon between the President and Secretary Kerry, mm -hmm. um, is that about the dissent memo, Syria? Uh, it's not. This is a, a meeting that the President has with Secretary Kerry on a weekly basis whenever the two of them are in town. Now, uh, the two of them are not in town at the same time every week. Uh, but when they are, they have a meeting. Uh, and so I would anticipate they'll cover a, a range of issues. I wouldn't rule out that, uh, that this topic could come up, but um, this meeting is not focused on, uh, uh, on the so-called dissent cable. What is, what is the President's view of that? Again, I, we heard the Vice President uh, basically dismiss it. Um, but uh, yeah. what, what is the, the President, I guess, uh, will say that he's, well, you tell me. Yeah, well, look, the, the, the President approves of this well-established process at the State the Department. There should be an opportunity for people who do have uh, a dissent to register to, to do so. Right. And that's a, that's a healthy part of the process. And look, the, the President has long acknowledged how difficult the situation in Syria is. And so the President would certainly welcome um, new ideas uh, that are put forward for confronting it. But there are no new ideas in that cable, that memo, that... Um, the, the, the proposals, I haven't read the cable, but based on the way that it's been reported, uh, those are things that have been previously considered. And look, the President is determined to make sure that the United States is, does not make the unwise assessment that somehow we can succeed in imposing a military solution uh, on Syria. Uh, we, the United States tried that uh, when President Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And, that did not lead to uh, results that were in our country's best interest. So the President wants to avoid that. And the President believes that we need to be focused on ISIL. Uh, and that if we take resources uh, that are currently dedicated toward ISIL and redirect them toward the Assad regime, uh, that's going to uh, not advance our, uh, our broader goal. Right. As I understand, it wasn't so much to impose a military solution. It was to use the military for more leverage. Is there, is there any... Yeah. Anything positive I, I, to report about the whole cessation of hostilities process, or is that essentially um, ended? Well, n no. The, the, the cessation of hostilities is something that we're working hard to try to keep from completely falling apart. Uh, there are uh, places where the cessation of hostilities has frayed uh, in a way that has had a very negative impact on the security situation inside of Syria. Uh, in those places where the cessation of hostilities has had some positive impact. The benefit has been that humanitarian aid has been to has been able to flow into some of those areas, uh, and some of those are areas that badly needed it. So, uh, I think the latest estimate that I've seen is more than 800,000 Syrians have been able to get some form of humanitarian relief in the last few months since the cessation of hostilities was put into place. That obviously is a positive consequence of that, but. 
Uh, look, there are far too many places where we have uh, seen the cessation of hostilities intermittently observed, and uh, uh, and that's uh, that's that's been frustrating. But I do want to go back to one element of uh, uh, of your question, which is, and this is sort of the way that it's um, the way that this is often considered, is that somehow the the use of the United States military could be used to enhance the leverage of the United States. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, I mean. I, I think what it means is it means that we should direct the force of the United States military against the Assad regime. Um, and I think there are a lot of questions that are raised about that. First of all, how do you do that without harming innocent civilians? Uh, second of all, I'm not sure exactly what legal authority the president would rely on uh, to do something like that. Um, and three, it seems like a slippery slope. Does that just mean that there's one round of missile strikes and then we spend a month trying to negotiate again, and then if nothing happens, do we launch more missile strikes, or then do we have to steadily ramp up the military engagement? Uh, and at what point does that stop? Um, it's hard to imagine where that stops, that that somehow stops short of um, a, a war against a sovereign nation that is being backed by Russia and Iran in a way that it's unclear to me how exactly that is going to apply additional pressure against ISIL, which is the extremist organization that we obviously are quite concerned about. Uh, we could uh, leave it to the military. To, to, I mean, there are there are proposals, obviously, like the um, safe zone and so forth. But you know, I, I, well, but I, I guess, guess this is the point. But, but uh, so I'm glad you say that because this, I think, is the point. The president is relying on his military advisors. They have not put forward a specific plan that would address the concerns that I've just raised. They acknowledge that. They, they are, the president is relying on them for the good military advice that he's getting thus far that is having the tangible impact of applying additional pressure on ISIL. We have made progress just looking inside of Syria in terms of regaining uh, more than 20 percent of the territory that ISIL previously controlled, and we've done that just by training uh, forces inside of Syria. So we are making progress in encircling Raqqa. We are applying significant pressure uh, against ISIL in Syria. We are having making progress in terms of uh, shutting off uh, uh, the border that they benefit from. So the point is the president is relying on the best military advice. He is following that military advice and it's showing results. Not as fast as we would like. It certainly hasn't turned Syria into a Jeffersonian democracy that reflects the pluralism and diversity of that country. But we are making progress and it's because the president is relying on the best advice uh, that's out there. And um, so, so it's important to remember that for all of the criticism about how the president's policy has not led to the kind of results that we'd all like to see inside of Syria, it's not because the president has failed to consider or implement an alternative proposal. There is nobody else that has put forward a specific idea, with the possible exception of uh, the safe zone that you referred to. I think the president's laid out in pretty clear terms why he doesn't think that's a, a good idea. And the truth is you don't hear a whole lot of people talking about that uh, anymore. And I don't even know if that was mentioned in uh, uh, the speech today from, frankly, the president's most high profile critic. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I, don't e I don't either. Yeah. I, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I just, just want on this humanity. The concern about is the about the humanitarian situation, mm -hmm. which is continuing to be a disaster. Um, just one in Fallujah, um, another situation where there are now tens of thousands of people who are um, fleeing the city, which is good in that they feel safe enough to do that. How concerned is the administration about what appears to be a, a developing humanitarian situation there, particularly in the Sunni area? Because you've said on a number of occasions about the need for uh, our coalition partners and others to essentially support those communities in term, once ISIL, ISIS is removed. How, co how concerned are you about the evolving situation or devolving situation in Fallujah right now? Yeah, well, uh, we, I, I actually was asking about this uh, with some of our, uh, I, I posed a, a question similar to this to some of our national security staff uh, earlier this week. And uh, it's important to understand that there are sort of two different situations here that we're concerned about. The first is, and the President has talked quite about, about this publicly, including when he met with the GCC countries uh, in Riyadh uh, earlier this spring, 
and that is ensuring that the Iraqi government has necessary resources to try to stabilize those communities that are liberated from ISIL. Uh, Ramadi is the best example of this. When ISIL controlled Ramadi, uh, they essentially destroyed the infrastructure of that city. They destroyed a number of buildings. And the Iraqi central government has been working hard to rebuild that city so that people can return to their homes. Uh, that is a way to certainly inspire a lot of confidence in the central government in, in Iraq. Uh, that The people of Ramadi know that the central government's looking out for them uh, if the central government is working hard to rebuild their city. The problem is, is that the central government of Iraq is rather cash-strapped right now. And so international financial assistance has been critical to ensuring they have the resources to accomplish that goal. And they've been working on that. And they will obviously need to use those kinds of resources to uh, rebuild Fallujah once the work has been done uh, to drive ISIL out of that city. Uh, that has primarily been an effort uh, led by the international community to provide resources to the central government of Iraq to accomplish that task. There's, you're asking, I, I think, uh, about a, a, a similarly important situation that's being handled somewhat differently. You're asking about a situation uh, as it relates to internally displaced persons. Uh, these are essentially individuals who, like you described, are, have been able now to flee Fallujah uh, because of the, the fighting there. While that doesn't necessarily sound like a good thing, uh, it probably is a sign of progress because previously those individuals uh, had been holed up in their homes uh, and ISIL hadn't let them out. Uh, so, but the question is, once they fled their homes and fled their city, um, where do they go? Uh, and it means that there are now tens of thousands of internally displaced Iraqis residents of the city of Fallujah who are fleeing violence. And what the United Nations has done is tried to step in uh, and collect funding from countries around the world to try to provide for the immediate humanitarian needs of individuals who are in that situation. Uh, there are already some uh, refugee camps, uh, or they're not technically refugees because they're still inside the country, but uh, camps for individuals who are internally displaced. Uh, but the capacity of those camps needs to expand to incorporate the tens of thousands of people who are fleeing the violence in Fallujah. So uh, the State Department announced yesterday that the United States had made a $20 million commitment to uh, funding those efforts. We're obviously going to need to see a lot more funding uh, for the UN-led efforts from around uh, the world. So uh, the State Department will be hosting a donor conference uh, to consider actually both of these questions, both stabilization funding that can be provided to the central government of Iraq, but also funding that can be provided to um, uh, the United Nations uh, as they organize efforts to try to meet the basic humanitarian needs of internally displaced people inside of Iraq. Thank you. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Is there a circumstance that you can envision or that the White House can envision whereby the North Koreans stop testing missiles? Well, it certainly would be in their interest to do so. Uh, right now, this is probably the most isolated country in the world. Uh, they are. Their economy is suffering under withering uh, economic sanctions that are not just imposed by the United States and our allies, Japan and South Korea, but also uh, have an impact, a significant impact, on their economic relationship with countries like Russia and China. Um, so there's a clear incentive for uh, the North Korean government to start abiding by their international obligations and living up to uh, the UN Security Council resolutions that apply in a situation like this. Um, so, but the choice is theirs, uh, and it'll be a uh, it'll be a choice that they'll have to make. Until that time, uh, they're going to be continue to be isolated. Their economy is going to suffer, and as a result of the decisions made by the North Korean government, unfortunately, the people of North Korea will suffer. Does the White House believe that Iran is at least in part helping to fund the missile program in Pyongyang? Uh, I don't have a. Uh, uh, an assessment uh, about that situation to share, but we'll see if we can get you one. Is it your understanding that there is a strong and lasting relationship between Tehran and Pyongyang as it relates to funding some of the missile programs that have been taking place in that country? Well, let me just say in general that we have previously expressed significant concerns about the degree to which both North Korea and Iran are contributing to um, the proliferation of weapons technology that's dangerous. Um, I don't, that's something that we've said in the past. I don't sort of have an updated assessment uh, uh, on that. I don't have an updated uh, assessment of sort of how uh, those countries have benefited from the actions of the other. 
uh, we can see if we can provide you some more information about the it. The reason though. I ask is because <coughs> if that's the case, and certainly in the past that certainly appeared to be the case, how is it a good idea that an American company might want to sell the Iranians aircraft technology, for example, while they continue to fund uh, a missile program that threatens not only our allies in the region, but indeed could threaten the United States mainly? Well, uh, the, so I think you're asking about the Boeing deal. Uh, and the, the, the direct question there is, uh, essentially, this is a result. This was written into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that was agreed to last year uh, and prevents Iran from being able to obtain a nuclear weapon. And the concern that the Iranian government had uh, is that their fleet of commercial aircraft, passenger aircraft, uh, was aging dramatically. And it was contributing to a rather unsafe situation inside of Iran. Uh, and I think this is a good uh, example uh, of how their desire to re-engage with the international community did give the United States and the international community leverage to get Iran to, to make a bunch of serious commitments as it relates to their nuclear program. So this is a benefit that Iran got only after we were able to definitively confirm independently that they had abided by the terms of the, the deal and that they had uh, essentially rendered harmless their plutonium reactor, that they had disconnected uh, thousands of centrifuges, that they had reduced their highly enriched uranium stockpile by 98%. Uh, only after we had confirmed that they'd taken all those steps and only after we have seen them continue to cooperate with independent verification method, uh, 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 systems uh, did we uh, uh, allow this kind of thing to move forward. What it doesn't change, however, are the sanctions that remain in place against Iran because of Iran's ballistic missile program. And those sanctions are in place. They are uh, occasionally toughened based on the discretion of the Treasury Department. And they are rigorously enforced. Uh, and they will continue to be as long as Iran continues to flout their international obligations when it comes to their ballistic missile program. And last, on the uh, Donald Trump uh, comments today, uh, he cited the video uh, that uh, then Secretary Clinton uh, suggested may have been behind the attack in uh, Benghazi. He cited uh, uh, her comments about landing under sniper fire overseas and, uh, and uh, previous uh, explanations for why she set up her private server as examples of her being a liar. He called her a world-class liar. Your reaction to his description based on those examples. Uh, again, I, I think for uh, direct responses to uh, to his speech, I'd refer you to Secretary Clinton's team. Okay, Chris. Josh, Sunday, June 26th is going to be the one-year anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in favor of uh, marriage equality nationwide. Also going to be the three-year anniversary <coughs> of the Supreme Court decision against the Defense of Marriage Act and California's Proposition 8. It's also the 13th anniversary of the Lawrence v. Texas decision against state laws criminalizing same-sex relations. Um, is there any consideration the uh, uh, on the part of the administration to designate June 26 as a federal holiday as a result of that uh, coincidence? Uh, I was not aware of that uh, coincidence at this point, uh, and so I'm not aware of any consideration of uh, making that day a, a federal holiday. But obviously, after the Supreme Court decision was announced last year, the president went out of his way uh, to acknowledge the historic nature uh, of that uh, decision and the significant impact, positive impact, that it would have all across the country. Uh, so it obviously is a day that, whether it's a federal holiday or not, is one that uh, the president will uh, long remember. But do you know uh, how the president will observe uh, the anniversary? Uh, that when it uh, I don't know if there will be any formal uh, uh, observance uh, on the part of the president this year. Okay. Cheryl. Thanks. If I can go back to health care. Um, Donald Trump has said he wants to repeal and replace Obamacare. He's called it a mess. Um, Speaker Ryan actually rolled out his plan today. Are there any changes to the Health Affordable Care Act that you would still like to see uh, made? Well, uh, Cheryl, what we have indicated is that the way that the Affordable Care Act has been implemented thus far has yielded enormous benefits for the American people. 20 million more Americans have health insurance uh, since the Affordable Care Act went into effect 
We've seen that the inflation rate of health care costs is at historic lows since the Affordable Care Act went into effect. Uh, and there are a wide variety of consumer protections that many Americans enjoy, including ensuring that they're not discriminated against for pre-existing conditions, ensuring that young adults can remain on their parents' health care until age 26, uh, and ensuring that Americans all across the country can get access to free preventative services, including birth control. That is also a requirement of Obamacare. So uh, there are a variety of ways in which the American people have benefited from uh, that historic law. Um, but what the President has said is that we remain open to good faith efforts by Democrats or Republicans to strengthen the law. We would welcome the opportunity to do that. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, what we've seen from Republicans almost 60 times now, I believe, uh, is an effort to repeal in whole or in part the Affordable Care Act. And um, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna keep health care costs low. That's not gonna get anybody health insurance. <clears throat> it also uh, didn't win him a presidential election in 2012. Uh, we'll see if it does this time. Well, I was really trying to get at, is there anything in the Ryan <clears throat> plan that you see that might be workable? Well, again, based on the details that we have seen, uh, I'm not sure that many people support them. I think that's why Speaker Ryan doesn't even want to put Republicans in a position of having to vote for it, because I don't think they would. Um, but, uh, and that's even before we see the details that are so unpopular they don't want to release them. Uh, and look, I understand why. It's not going to be popular to increase the deficit, which is exactly what uh, would happen if Republicans were to repeal uh, some of the measures uh, included in the Affordable Care Act that they have identified. Um, and they would be taking away health care from millions of people. We don't know exactly how many millions because they've refused to release some key details that would provide insight into that. But again, since this is a political document, I understand why they wouldn't want to release the details. But I think that's also why it's not worthy of uh, consideration as a legislative proposal. Okay. Karen. Um, there's some signs, uh, Josh, that there might be a deal coming soon on the Zika funding um, between the House and Senate numbers. You know, you've gone over all the numbers. And, you know, the President wants the $1.9 billion. But if that is not in the cards, are you prepared to accept a number that's somewhere between the House and the Senate numbers that they've agreed on? Well, uh, it's not just the President who wants $1.9 billion in funding. Uh, it is the top scientists and public health professionals in the United States who say that we need $1.9 billion in funding to do everything possible to protect the American people from the Zika virus. So I don't, again, I don't really understand why we would stop short of that. Um, the second thing I would say is that We've seen a significant group of Democratic and Republican governors come forward and say that Congress should approve significant resources to fight the Zika virus. But here we are, four months after the administration put forward our detailed, specific legislative proposal for this funding, and Republicans in Congress have not approved it. And uh, we've seen half measures put in place. I don't even think you could call the House version a half measure. It's a third measure, because uh, it ba is barely a third of what our public health professionals say is necessary to protect the country from the Zika virus. So um, I understand that there are bipartisan negotiations that are ongoing on Capitol Hill, but time's a wasting. It's been four months since the president identified this as a significant problem. It's actually been longer than that, because the president met with his national security team back in January to begin discussing this issue because he recognized there's a significant threat here. But it's been four months since the administration put forward a very specific proposal backed by our nation's top public health professionals to outline exactly what's needed. And again, I don't understand why Congress would stop short of providing everything that our health care professionals say is necessary to do everything possible to protect the American people from the Zika virus. But is something better than nothing? And if they don't get something done by recess, then what? Well, look, I, I, think, uh, I think if they don't get anything done by recess, I think you're going to find members of the Republican members of the United States Congress facing very tough questions from their constituents about why they are falling down on the job on something that is so critical to the public health of the American people, particularly given the unique threat that this poses to pregnant women and their newborn babies. And a quick one. Um, 
Hillary Clinton's in town today. She was meeting with Democrats on the Hill. Uh, did she or is she planning this stuff by the White House today? Uh, I'm not aware of any meetings that she has at the White House today. Okay. Tolu. Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, I wanted to ask about Brexit, the, the votes coming up tomorrow. I know you've been asked about this a couple of times, but is there any plan for the president to um, weigh in again in any significant way uh, about about this upcoming vote. Uh, no, I'm not aware of uh, uh, any plans on the part of the president to weigh in once again. Obviously, when uh, when the president was uh, uh, in London earlier this year, he was asked about it, and he had an opportunity to give a rather robust explanation, uh, or I should say description, of his view of this matter. Uh, and look, I, I the, the immediate impact of uh, his comments were felt across the country, both in terms of the news coverage, but also in some of the uh, uh, public opinion polling uh, over there. But we'll have to, uh, to see what the outcome is here. We've been very clear about the President's view that the United States benefits from having a uh, UK as a member of a strong EU. But ultimately, it's the British people who should decide for themselves. They're a sovereign country. They're a country with whom we have a special relationship, uh, and the British people are certainly entitled to make uh, these kinds of decisions for themselves and for their country. If I can ask about the Syrian dissenters again, um, <coughs> or the dissent I understand the channel you on Syria. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that sort of all the ideas that you understand are in the dissent are sort of ideas that have already been considered. Um, but haven't the, the sort of the situation on the ground, haven't, hasn't that changed to a certain extent? Uh, to where those ideas may be worth revisiting. The cessation of hostilities uh, was tried and to a certain extent hasn't held up. So isn't it somewhat worth sort of revisiting those old ideas now that the situation on the ground has changed? Well, Tolu, I, I don't think so. Uh, again, for many of the reasons that, uh, that Ron and I were discussing. Uh, again, to the extent that there are specific proposals in there, uh, and again, I, I'm not sure what it means the judicious use of military force to enhance the leverage of American negotiators. I understand what that means in principle, but I don't, I don't really know what that means in application. I'm not sure that such a thing exists. More importantly, I'm not sure that our military leaders uh, know that such a thing exists. Uh, I think the real risk of that kind of approach is multifold. Uh, it certainly does raise questions about a slippery slope that could lead uh, the United States deep into a uh, another ground war in the Middle East focused on removing uh, the leader of a Muslim country. That didn't turn out very well last time we tried that. It's unclear to me exactly what sort of legal authority the President would have to do something like that. Um, it's also unclear exactly how that would have a positive impact on our efforts to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Um, so. Again, I, 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 the President's been quite direct uh, about how challenging the situation is inside of Syria. Uh, I, I think that, um, but for all the criticism, other with the possible exception of the no-fly zone, our critics aren't really putting forward specific, tangible alternatives to the policy that the President is currently pursuing. Secretary Kerry met with uh, a group of these dissenters yesterday. I imagine during that meeting they may have put forward some specifics. Is, does the President have any interest in meeting with any of the people who wrote this dissent? Uh, I'm not aware of any sort of meeting like that that, uh, that the President would engage in. I think it's appropriate for the Secretary of State to meet with uh, individuals inside his own agency who have uh, written the memo. but. But I don't anticipate at this point that the President would uh, meet with the authors of it. Okay. Jerome. Thank you, John. Just to follow up on the Brexit, you, you've stated many times the President's position on, on, on the subject, but could you tell us a bit about the way he approaches tomorrow's vote? Is he how closely is he monitoring the, the polls, the debate over there? How, I mean, how, how worried is he about the, the outcome? Well, I, I, um, I know the President has been following. Uh, the uh, the campaign, and has certainly been aware of the the advocacy that's gone on on both sides. Um, I don't anticipate that the president will be uh, watching returns. Uh, the president is traveling tomorrow and uh, will be on the west coast. 
for most of the day. But I'm, the, the president is certainly interested in the results, and once a, a result has been reached, I'm, uh, I'm sure the president will be interested to hear what it is. The president described when he was in London, as you recall, that the, the stakes for the UK are quite high, uh, but uh, there are significant consequences for the United States as well. Uh, so this is a decision for the British people to make, but uh, the outcome matters a great deal to the United States, and it's something that the president will uh, will monitor accordingly. Okay, Mark. Josh, in the interview with um, Derek Jeter, President Obama said that he's looking forward at the end of his presidency to catching up on some sleep. And I was wondering if you've got any way of quantifying how much sleep does the president get most nights? And should we be worried that uh, he doesn't get enough? Well, I think, um, I think what the president would say is that um, he gets enough, uh, but I think like most of us, uh, he'd be happy to get a little bit more. Um, look, I, th I think it was mostly a lighthearted exchange about his post-presidency. And serious well, I, I think uh, I think he would certainly, uh, like I said, I think he would enjoy the opportunity to uh, have some more sleep and have some more sleep that I su suppose would be uh, more restful without the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, but I think was what was also evident from that interview is how much the president has enjoyed being president. You know, he's deeply enjoyed uh, and derived great pleasure from having the opportunity to, to serve in this job and. Uh, to be the commander in chief of the finest fighting force that the world's ever known is something that gives him great pleasure and uh, of some, something of which he is immensely proud. Uh, but the president's also had an opportunity to uh, influence our country uh, and our debates uh, and the world, uh, consistent with his values and consistent with uh, the kinds of things that up to this point he's been uh, fighting for throughout his career. And so uh, his tenure in the White House has been enormously satisfying, but uh, he's also looking to a life post-presidency that includes more and more restful sleep. Have you ever known him to take a nap um, during the course of a work day? Uh, certainly not during the course of a work day. Um, no, I can't think of a, a, of a situation in which I've observed the president napping. <laughs> Does he ever get to sleep in? Well, I, I, um, I don't have as much uh, detail about the president's sleep habits as you might think. Um, I'm not sure why you would think that I would have a lot of detail about the president's sleeping habits. I don't. Uh, I think, like most people, I suspect the president does allow himself to sleep in a little later on weekends. Can I follow up on the baseball theme? Okay. JC, go ahead. I'd like to follow up on the baseball theme, and I'd like to get off this, the nap theme. <laughs> you and me both. Is there a difference? With the president. Is the president doing any yoga? Would <laughs> <laughs> the president sometime in his future? consider uh, becoming, uh, if, if, if offered, the uh, commissioner of, base, of uh, Major League Baseball? Well, I'm not aware of any uh, offer like that that's, uh, that's being considered. Obviously, the president is a fan of his uh, hometown Chicago White Sox. Um, but um, I, I think the president has discussed uh, previously that he would have an interest, potentially, if the opportunity arose under the right circumstances, to be part of an ownership group of, uh, of an NBA franchise. Uh, so the president is uh, obviously a big NBA fan, and uh, so I don't know if that kind of opportunity will present itself, but uh, I suspect that's something that he would enjoy. I guess it is. I guess it is. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks, Josh. Um, so in today's House Financial Services uh, Committee hearing with Chairman Yellen, um, Republican Chairman Jeff Hensterling criticized the administration's close relationship with the uh, Fed. He called it something like a revolving door. What? What does the president view as his relationship with Chairman Yellen, and is there any merit to a claim like that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I I didn't watch the hearing today, so I don't know um, if uh, if the chairman presented any uh, evidence to substantiate uh, his claim. Uh, what I will just say as a matter of principle and as a matter of policy is that the president believes that the United States and our economy benefits significantly from having monetary decisions made um, independently. Uh, and this is a principle that is, um, I think, has been important to our, uh, our country's economic success, not just uh, over the last seven years, but over the last um, several generations. Um, so this is an important principle and one that the, that the Obama administration has abided by scrupulously. Um, and in fact, 
that kind of independence was part of um, the criteria that the president um, has drawn upon in choosing um, someone to lead uh, the Federal Reserve. So uh, the president's decision to renominate uh, Chairman Bernanke uh, earlier in his presidency and then his decision to uh, nominate Janet Yellen as chair of the Federal Reserve um, was in part influenced by both Mr. Bernanke's and Ms. Ms. Yellen's commitment to the independence of the Fed. They take that quite seriously. The president does too. Okay. Uh, John. Uh, if a Zika bill came over that looked more like the Senate bill, had some offsets, you're not going to get the 1.9. Can you rule out a veto of something like that? Yeah. Well, John, this definitely falls in that category of things that uh, if we're just you and me and we had a you know, blank piece of paper here, we could probably sketch out a pretty common sense proposal uh, just in our negotiations that you know, maybe we'd get the advice of Dr. Fauci a little bit and we'd probably hammer it out in an hour or two, even though neither you nor I is a public health professional. Um, so those kinds of negotiations when they go through Congress, however, take somewhat longer. Uh, and so it's hard to judge at this point exactly how it's going to turn out. Uh, and um, you know, we'll obviously make sure that our views are known uh, as that process continues. But um, unfortunately, we just won't be in a position to negotiate it from here. How serious the White House feels about the gun issue and Zika. Why hasn't the president done more? Why hasn't he picked up the phone, maybe scheduled some meetings, had some members over here? Well, again. The president believes that his number one priority uh, is protecting the country and protecting the American people. He believes that should be Congress's number one priority, too. I don't really understand why the president should be in a position where he has to twist arms in Congress to get Republicans to do the common sense things that would protect the country from the Zika virus. So again, the president lent his voice uh, and his own legislative, his team's legislative expertise to putting together and trying to advance the necessary funding to fight Zika that our public health professionals asked for. And we've continued to make the case for why that's important. We've certainly given uh, Dr. Frieden, Dr. Fauci, and other senior public health professionals in the United States uh, a platform to help all of you understand exactly why this is an important issue. Uh, Dr. Frieden, Dr. Fauci, and others have spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. Secretary Burwell has as well. Uh, those conversations have been focused on how this money would be spent and why it's critical to the health and safety of the American people, particularly pregnant women and uh, newborn babies. But look, at some point, Republicans in Congress just have to decide if they're going to do their job. And frankly, this one should be an easy one or at least trying to twist a few arms part of the job? Yeah, look, and I think that's why we've advocated for it. Um, and I've, but, you know, it's, the president has certainly made the case that this is an important thing for Congress to do. The president rolled this out with a lot of fanfare. The president discussed this proposal uh, in an interview, nationally televised interview with CBS. Um, the President has had individual conversations with members of Congress. We certainly have had, you've seen uh, uh, Dr. Fauci and other senior officials at the uh, CDC staying at this podium making the case for why this is important. So we've made a robust case. I know Secretary Burwell has spent a lot of time talking to individual members of Congress. So you know, we've made a substantive case about why this is important. But at some point, Republicans in Congress actually have to do the job that they worked so hard to get. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Josh. Uh, over 100 House Democrats yesterday sent a letter to the President asking him to remove the citizenship requirement for um, federal aid, especially for DACA recipients who are not eligible for education uh, federal uh, help. Um, do you know if the President has received a letter and if there will be any consideration on the matter? Uh, I am not aware of the letter, but why don't I check on it? We'll see if we can get your response. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'll give you the last one. Thank you, Josh. Uh, the President Obama sent a notice and a message to the Congress on the continuation of the national emergency with the North Korea 
So do you have anything more detail on this? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that is just a, uh, a regular notification to Congress that our significant concerns about North Korea's provocations persist. And you know, it explains why we continue to have uh, tough sanctions in place to isolate North Korea and the work that we're doing to try to persuade them to come into compliance with their international obligations. So um, that is just a notification to Congress that's required on a regular schedule uh, to describe why uh, we continue to have significant concerns um, with the decisions that are being made in North Korea. You don't have anything, take any action to the North Korea? Uh, at this point, uh, and uh, it was just yesterday uh, that we did detect um, two missile launches from uh, North Korea. And uh, we're going to continue to consult with our allies and partners in the region. And certainly the members of the President's national security team will uh, review uh, additional information about these tests and consider uh, an appropriate response. One more, one more question. Sure. Now. President played golf every weekend. I'm wondering what is his handicap? <laughs> <laughs> that's a national security secret? Um, I, uh, that's just a joke. Um, the uh, the president, I, I don't know the president's uh, handicap, uh, but uh, his golf game has improved. Well, yeah. hey, Jeff, Jeff so. is a professional golfer. So, oh, well, maybe we'll uh, have you out on the range sometime. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.